IPv6 hosts build routes based on information learned dynamically from nearby routers. We'll look at those in this video and learn about both default routes and on-link routes. This video covers some topics that you'll find in the first section of the Official CERT Guides, Volume 1, Chapter 28, which is about IPv6 on hosts. We'll start with a quick review of neighbor discovery, but I've got another whole video on neighbor discovery protocol for learning MAC addresses of neighbors. Then we'll get into the meat of this video talking about router discovery from which a host then builds a default route. And then prefix discovery, learn from a router, but prefix discovery from which a host will build on-link routes. Then we'll close with a brief topic on duplicate address detection, a function to make sure your address is not used by another host before you start using it. As always, if you stick around to the end, for those that have the book, I'll give you some hints on how to best use that book section along with this video. Then for everyone, I'll tee up a study or review exercise for you so you can review the content in this video. Also, thanks for helping me build a channel. There are many ways you can do that, but possibly the number one way is to make a habit of clicking like when you watch my videos. That tells YouTube, put this stuff in front of more people. Regardless, thanks for helping me build the channel. It's much appreciated. Now let's get into the content. Here are the functions supplied by the NDP protocol. And in another video, we talked about neighbor discovery, which replaces ARP. And in this video, we'll talk about the three in bold here, router discovery, prefix discovery, and duplicate address detection. All right, so we'll do those one after the other here for the next few moments. But just to review neighbor discovery, that is learning a neighbor's MAC address based on its IP version 6 address. Say host A wants to send a packet to host C. So A's got a neighbor table, and that neighbor table might be empty right now, or at least not list host C. So say A knows C's IP version 6 unicast address and needs to learn its MAC address. So NDP has a function for A to learn that dynamically. A sends a neighbor solicitation message. It's received by host C. It lists host C's IP version 6 address saying basically, hey, if that's you, reply and tell me your MAC address. And host C replies with a neighbor advertisement advertising its MAC address. And with that information, A can complete its neighbor table entry. And now it has all the information it needs to build the Ethernet frame that encapsulates the IPv6 packet to send a packet over to host C. And that's NDP neighbor discovery. Now let's talk about hosts and the default router and a default route. So for IPv6, a host like host A is going to have a default route represented by double colon slash zero. This is the prefix that represents all addresses. So packets that don't match any other routes in A's routing table will match this route. Now that route will be set up by host A to list some router's link local address as the next top router. So what does that mean? When a destination is off link, that is it's not a subnet on this link, then host A is going to want to send those packets to some router and it's going to use this default route to accomplish that. Now, in order for host A to put this route in its routing table, it uses a little different logic and a little different mechanism than what happened with IP version 4. So that starts out with A learning about routers on the link directly from the routers, which doesn't happen with IP version 4. So here's the idea. A can send an NDP message called router solicitation, soliciting information from routers, and then all the routers each reply. So if R1's the only router, it replies and it lists all its unicast addresses, its link local address and its global unicast address. So now A knows those facts. Now, A is going to take that information and act on it. It wants to have the idea of using a default router. And to use the default router, R1 in this case, it builds that default route. So here in A's routing table, you should expect to see a route with this destination of double colon slash zero with a next top router of the link local address, not the global unicast address of a router learned with one of these NDP RS and RA message exchanges. Now let's dig into a little more depth on the messages themselves. 
So A sends these NDP RS messages, and it looks like this with the RS in here preceded by an IPv6 header. Now, the destination address is this well-known reserved multicast address of FoxFox02 colon colon 2. And this is an address you reserved for use by all routers on any link. So if you're a router connected to a link, you should be listening for messages sent to that address. So R1 should be listening for these messages. Host like host A can send messages to this destination address, expecting all routers on the link to receive that message. The destination MAC address is derived from that multicast address, by the way. So the switch sees that as a multicast Ethernet frame and floods it where it needs to go, but not flooding it out every interface. Then when R1 receives that message, it can reply back with the unicast message. It can use A's link local address because it learned that in the first message. So the router advertisement that R1 returns is, in effect, a unicast reply. So it's a multicast solicitation and a unicast router advertisement back to host A. Now, there is another variation on this theme, and it's this idea of a gratuitous, gratuitous or unsolicited router advertisement. So here's the idea. All the hosts on every link want to know about the routers on the link. So routers will occasionally send out an unsolicited RA and advertise their addresses. So it's usually a couple of minute timer. So here's an RA. But if we want this message to go out on the LAN and reach everyone, we need a way to send it so it reaches everyone. So there's another reserved multicast address, FoxFox02 colon colon one, which is supposed to be reserved for use by all IPv6 hosts. That is, if you're a device, you're using IPv6, you should be listening, listening for multicast sent to that address. So these messages should go to all hosts in this subnet, receive a copy of this RA. And so you can sit back and wait. You don't have to solicit the router. You can boot up and wait, expecting for routers to advertise themselves with these unsolicited or gratuitous RAs. Now let's talk about the rest of the core routing logic on a host. So looking at the notes at the bottom there, it's like the destination is in the same subnet. We want to send packets directly, like host A sending to host B. It doesn't need to use the router. So to sum up, host A, when it wants to send a packet that's off subnet somewhere, it's not on the same link, it's off link, it's going to send the packets to a router, the default router. But if the destination is on link, it just wants to send those directly to the other destination. Now, the way an IPv6 a host implements this is they put a route in the routing table for all the on-link prefixes. And the details diverge a bit from how IP version 4 did this. So let's talk about that. So quick review. A learned about the default router with those RS and RA messages that we just talked about. And that RA message included the router's link local address and its global unicast address. So that should be familiar. But in addition to that, that same RA message lists prefix. We call that prefix discovery. So A sending that same router solicitation request, that same RA message it gets back already has this information about the prefixes. Now, this is key. With IP version 4, hosts just calculated the subnet ID based on their IP version 4 settings. With IP version 6, the prefix and prefix length is learned in this message exchange. Now, what's significant about that? The hosts all have a consistent view of what the subnet is on the link because they're all getting the same information from the router. We don't have as many issues then with misconfigured hosts not working as we would with IP version 4. So it's a nice improvement in the protocol. So here's what happens. You've got this router, R1 over here. It knows about the prefix and prefix link uh, links here on the link. And when it sends the RA message back, it lists this prefix and prefix length. Then the host to implement that idea of, hey, all packets that are local send direct, it adds a route for this prefix and prefix length. However, when it adds that, it does not list the router's next top address as the next top address. It lists just a notation that says on link or something to that effect, which tells host A, hey, when you're sending a packet to any packets that match this destination prefix, 
send them directly because they are indeed on link. Now let's talk about the final feature in this video, duplicate address detection. So here's the idea. Hosts, routers, anything that uses IPv6 uses it. So when an interface first comes up and you have a unicast address there, be it a global unicast or link local address, it tests to make sure no other device on the link is using that. It's just to make sure you're not duplicating addresses. So how does it do that check? When an interface comes up, that device sends a neighbor solicitation for itself. So if I'm host A, I send one for my IP version 6 unicast address. Now, if my address is unique, no one should reply. So we give it a little time, no reply, I'm unique, go for it. But if we get back a neighbor advertisement, it means someone saw my neighbor's solicitation and are using the same address and replied, and now we realize we have a duplicate address. So the one that sent the NS doesn't use that address until that conflict can be resolved. So the mechanism is somewhat straightforward. Here we have host A and server C again. And notice here, the orange addresses, A is going to use this IPv6 address or try to, but C is already using the same exact IP version 6 address. So DAD comes up. It causes A to send this neighbor solicitation. It's logic, as we just reviewed, say, hey, I'm going to send this NS, but I don't expect to receive a reply. And if I receive a reply, it, it sums wrong, right? So the target lists my own, in this case, Jose's own IP version 6 unicast address. It flows out over the network. C sees it, thinks it's an NS for C. C replies with this NA. Now host A realizes there's a duplicate address out there on the network. Thanks for hanging around till the end. This content matches content you'll find in the Official Cert Guide, Volume 1, Chapter 28, in the first section. And that whole section is about the Neighbor Discovery Protocol. It's a hugely important protocol for IPv6. I'd say go ahead and read the section anyway. Make sure you lock this stuff in. All right. Read it for importance. Now, this video is about router and prefix discovery mainly. There was a separate video about neighbor discovery. You want to watch both of those before launching into this interview review video because you'll need all that information in order to answer the interview. The interview will use this topology you see on the left. We've got host A at the top and server S2 at the bottom. And basically, A is going to ping server S2's global unicast address that you see here and get a reply. And that's great, right? But the question for you then is, in an interview, is if you saw this on the marker board and they said, hey, A pinged S2 and it worked, uh, I want you to talk to me about NDP. And I want you to tell me what NDP overhead events happened before the ping occurred. And then what NDP events happened in reaction to the ping so that it would work, right? Just, you know, what, what else needed to happen by NDP in order to support that ping and make it work. So it gives you a chance to think through from a different direction all the things you just saw in these last two videos. Hope you enjoyed the video. Thanks for hanging out. If you haven't already, of course, click subscribe and the bell so you get notified about upcoming videos or click like if you liked it and help support the channel. It's always appreciated. Thanks for spending time with me. I'll talk to you soon.